Welcome to today's EHS Today webcast, What is Greenhouse Gas Gap Analysis and Should We Get One? Sponsored by SGS North America. I'm Adrienne Selko, Senior Editor of EHS Today. Before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if at any time you are having audio difficulties or slides are not advancing, simply hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. If you are running pop-up blocking software, you will need to disable it to view the webinar. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please push the question mark help button in the upper right, right corner to receive assistance in solving common issues. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the maximize icon in the upper right corner to enlarge the window. We welcome your questions during today's event. To submit them, simply type it into the Ask a Question window on the left side of your screen and hit the Submit button. We will be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but feel free to send in your questions at any time. Don't forget to check out the Resources tab on your console for more information from today's sponsor, SGS North America. Also be aware today's session is being recorded and will be available on the EHS Today website within the next day for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. And when the webinar ends, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that will appear on your screen. Let me introduce today's speaker. We have Adam Hamus, who is ESG Director for SGS North America. Adam is a transformational ESG CSR sustainability prop professional, author, and speaker who has founded related businesses, nonprofits, and industry association. Adam holds credentials as sustainability excellence professional, certified GRI professional, certified climate change professional, and financial sustainability accounting credential level one. Adam helps clients with various ESG services investor scoring improvements, strategic planning, executive coaching, stakeholder engagement, materiality assessments, reporting, and marketing. For more about Adam, please check out the speaker details tab on your console. And with that, welcome Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thanks to everyone for taking time out of your busy days to listen to this topic. One that is near and dear to my heart. Um, we are going to talk briefly. I'll just tell you who SGS is if you don't know. Um, we'll talk about the five top greenhouse gas business drivers and how those tie directly into what is a greenhouse gap analysis and some comparisons so you know what it isn't. Um, a couple of business examples um, to show you how that can look differently for different businesses and the best timing and benefits of getting a greenhouse gas gap analysis and then leave plenty of time for Q&A. You heard who I am. Hopefully you've heard of SGS. We are boots on the ground around the world. We've been around for 140 plus years. We have 98,000 employees, 2,650 offices. We cover almost every industry. Um, so we have quite a scope and sustainability has been embedded in the company for quite some time from the top to the bottom, from the board to every auditor. And so it's something that we're not new to. Um, in fact, if you look at the launch and the creation of most of the standards throughout the last 25 to 30 years, we've been at the forefront involved in those working groups. Uh, and now we verify as many of those standards as possible. And we get recognized for our actual performance ourselves internally uh, by every rating agency that is reputable. Um, and we do that not only for our own investors and our leadership and our stakeholders, but to prove to our customers that we, we know what we're doing. And so <clears throat> just to kick things off, since we're talking about greenhouse gas, it's really good to get just a feeling for everyone in the room. How would you rate your per, uh, personal expertise in greenhouse gas accounting, or some people just call it calculating your carbon footprint? Um, so you can be beginner, you know, novice to advanced, you might have no experience, um, but what would you rate yourself? Because it does matter and where you are in the process is going to impact um, what you want to take as your next steps because uh, we would never tell everyone to do the exact same thing. I think it's really important to just put yourself somewhere, um, understand your existing reality, your existing competencies, maybe even the competencies of your team, and then take the next step. 
So a couple more seconds as everyone is participating, which thank you, it's fast and good participation. I'll give it five more seconds and then we'll check out the results. All right, so we're gonna send those results out to everybody. And as you can see, we've got a lot of beginners, a lot of novice, nobody thinks they're a master. I would say there's some folks on my team that I would um, say that you're a master. <laughs> Uh, to them, but I would say I'm probably in the advanced and we have some really amazing people on our team, PhDs and uh, masters with 10 plus years of experience. So you um, shouldn't be necessarily aspiring to that, but there's a fantastic opportunities to continue to build your competencies, which we'll talk about later. So you really need to know what's driving your program to know what the right choice is, if gap analysis is for you. So let's just briefly talk about um, Oh, and then I have the slide here. I think I was a little out of order. Just so you know, whatever level you're at, we have a beginner course. We, we offer these trainings. They're actually happening right now. Not that you're going to jump into those, um, but we offer them quarterly public and we offer private courses. So we have beginner all the way up to um, a lead verifier. If you actually want to become a verifier, you could work for SGS. Um, but we do a ton of training, high quality. We're known for our greenhouse gas training. These are one-day modules. You can take them as you see fit. Um, just check out SGS Academy. But those drivers, um, the number one driver that surprises a lot of people is really we're still talking about the ESG ratings, and those are investor-driven scores um, that are really for creditors and investors, financial institutions and investor groups. They're using them to make buy, sell, and lend decisions. The reason this is the number one driver is because it has teeth and that publicly traded companies, whether they wanted to or not for the last decade, have been receiving scores from a variety of these. So these are the ones that have kind of stood the test of time. Um, Dow Jones Sustainability Index, DJSI, Morgan Stanley Capital or MSCI, Institutional Shareholder Services, ISS, and then Sustainalytics, which is more of a pure, it started and has never been anything other than an ESG rating agency while the others kind of rolled off um, and expanded into ESG, but clearly folks recognize those names. And then Ecovadis, which is a little different, we'll talk about them later. It's actually the fastest, but it's not just for publicly traded companies. Um, they operate a little differently. And the reason this is the number one driver is because those investor scores have been around and people are trying to get better um, relationships with their investors or potential investors or banks, um, lending rates, uh, access to actual sustainable finance, um, products that are in the market, sustainability linked bonds and sustainability linked loans. And so that's why this still in North America, which we're about five years behind, typically Europe, um, South America and East Asia when it comes to regulation of these sorts, which is no different here. Um, but then what I call a second wave, if you talk about supply chain customers, really those brands, it's a, it's a jump off point from the first driver. Those large brands are now being scored and are more so looking at the things that are a little harder to control, which is their supply chain. And those supply chain impacts are now pushing down into suppliers, which are smaller, medium-sized companies, often privately held, that were not subject to impact scores of their own or ESG ratings of their own. But now the big brands that do have scores are really trying to improve their scores by improving their supply chain performance. Um, if you look at different um, standards as well, those are changing. Scope three emissions are supply chain greenhouse gas emissions, for instance, where it used to be greenhouse gas protocol, now ISO 14064-1 and the 2018 version specifically, which has been around for three plus years, is now mandatory that you evaluate your scope three emissions. And so that is happening in a lot of different settings. And so what you have are these requests or mandates. Um, sometimes people call them a CDP survey or we got an EcoVadis survey from a big client. And that means that a big customer of yours is asking you to report. CDP is purely climate change um, or climate emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. There are 13,000 reporters and growing quickly because a lot of regulations are tied to requesting that people actually report into CDP as a part of that legislation. Um, there are 317 big brands that are actually supply chain members, which means they've made a public commitment that all their suppliers are gonna report uh, through CDP. Whereas EcoVadis is a much broader, it includes greenhouse gas reporting, but it has broader environmental, social, and governance disclosures per industry. And it is the fastest growing platform by far, has 100,000 reporters and growing. 
there are 10 different initiatives within different industries where multiple brands have collaborate and say, we're also going to ask our suppliers to report through EcoVadis. And that's just a huge data collection opportunity where CDP is public. EcoVadis is popular because specifically um, it is not public. It is semi-public where the only requirement is that if a brand invites you as their supplier, you can give them and only them permission to roll your score up into their composite supply chain score. And that's really the why it's used. EcoVadis also have survey tools and things that they're built in. But the reason people probably have less barriers to entry is it's not public. You know, Joe Plummer isn't going out there on Google and can find your scores. The only people that see your scores are the people that you allow to see your scores. And so for that reason, it's picking up pace quite quickly. Um, and so the majority of EcoVadis requests do include greenhouse gas emissions. So that's really the second wave that's pushing down into those supply chains. And we have a ratings boost service, which I won't belabor, but it's a fantastic way to roadmap and improve just your points. And most quickly, um, how can you adjust that score and know exactly why the methodology is rating you the way it is. If number three, which usually surprises people, but I mentioned regulations, we're just not as um, forward as, and out front with regulations as Europe, South America, and East Asia. So if you have a supply chain, if your company is multinational in Europe, you're going to be exposed to CSRD requirements. So if you're in Brazil, South America, you have things like the National Greenhouse Gas um, Emissions Reporting System, and there are things like that globally. But if you're just in Canada and the U.S., you might and have been for years a part of the greenhouse gas reporting programs that are federally mandated. Those are your very, very largest emitters. Um, but folks typically know that and they're very familiar with the program. Everything else are proposed rulings. I believe the Canadian Federal Supplier Climate Rule actually has taken effect. That is any suppliers over a contract value with the federal government over 25 million, they're required to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions and set uh, science-based targets. And then if you have um, in the United States, there's a proposed federal supplier, similar climate rule, but that's much lower. If it's if your contract with the federal government is 7.5 million or above, um, there is a scope one and two reporting um, requirement as well as reporting to CDP. And then if you are a federal supplier of 25 million and above annual contract value with the federal government, you have to also report scope three emissions and set science-based targets. Then there's the infamous SEC climate ruling those rules were delayed in court. They're now expected actually next month in October to be published what the new rule um, suggestion is. There is very much um, belief that there will be another court ruling, or not court ruling, but a court challenge. Uh, but most folks believe that they're going to remove the scope three requirements and therefore have it be material to every business. Um, and that scope one and two will pass. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I'll just tell you what from the groups that we're a part of, that's the expectation is it will be watered down to just be scope one and scope two, and they'll they'll announce that in um, October, and that will apply to all publicly traded companies in the, in the United States. So that's why regulation is slow here, not the main driver, but it is something to watch out for, and it is also um, almost purely on greenhouse gas. If you look at any of the rules, it's not broad sustainability or broad ESG, it is specifically greenhouse gas emissions reporting. And then distant fourth and fifth, I won't belabor it, but there is a consumer market that's really heavy um, for what they call the LOHAS consumer market, lifestyles of health and sustainability. It's one of the reasons that a lot of companies, 50% of them um, surveyed by the McKinsey Group, have said that their actual business growth is what's driving their sustainability initiatives. So offering new products and services that are socially and environmentally responsible to sell more goods and services to the consumer base. And then employees, which is fifth, but I think when you look at the talent wars, if you really just focus on sort of high-end talent that are difficult to recruit, maybe out of state, um, very selective or highly trained skilled workers, um, that does become a much bigger issue because they have a lot of choices. Um, and if you look at surveys that have been done recently in 2020 and then IBM's 2022 survey, the majority of, you know, above 65%, you could say, 
um, consistently say that their company is not doing enough. They would prefer working for a different, better company, and they're more willing to apply for and accept positions with what they consider sustainable companies. So not the main driver, but something to keep in mind. What is important is actually for you to say, what is your organization's number one business driver for tracking emissions? Because that's going to determine what kind of services or what kind of pro, um, program you're going to implement and sort of the rigor and how far you're going to have to take it. So if it's rating supply chain customers, regulations, consumers, or employees, or it could be something else, it's still really important to know what's the number one. And so I'm going to send you this survey. Typically, what you're going to find is it's a mixture. You might have all five, but it might be 75% regulation and then a little bit you know, supply chain customer, or you might be 100% supply chain customer, no regulations, or you might sell directly to consumers and you have a huge consumer piece. But what's important is you understand your organization and what's driving your initiative. And so if you have other, I just suggest throw it in the um, questions box, maybe. Uh, we don't have a chat as much, but it would be great to hear if you have some others, because I see those popping up. Um, and it's definitely possible. If you're not publicly traded, some of those ESG ratings may or may not um, hit your desk. However, CDP and Ecovadis may. And so even if it's not the big four, um, it might be some of those smaller surveys like CDP and Ecovadis. So I'll give it a few more seconds and I'm going to send those results out, but it definitely looks like we've got a lot of supply chain pressure, which does not surprise me. And then also you've got some regulation followed by the ESG ratings. So thanks for your participation. Now let's jump into the meat of this. Um, what is a greenhouse gap analysis? And let's do some comparisons, because I think one of the most important things is not only what something is, but to understand it, you know, what isn't it? Um, so let's head to the next slide. The best way to explain it from my point of view is if you want a greenhouse gap analysis, it's where you're already making progress on greenhouse gas emissions, you know, reporting or quantification and measurement, and you want a qualified second opinion, but maybe not, you're not ready for a verification, which we can talk about that later. But in the whole scheme of things from, you know, start to finish, you've got competency building, you're usually taking some sort of greenhouse gas training for your own employees, then you start execution, which you're doing some sort of calculations or advisory service, or you're getting GHG software. Um, some folks, if you're smaller, you, you will do it in spreadsheets. It's very common to start that way. Um, but then a spot check, if you think about it as, hey, we're not ready yet, but we, we need some confidence before we take the next steps. We want to make sure we're doing everything right. That's a gap analysis. Where medium rigor is when you're actually getting a limited greenhouse gas verification, usually to a standard greenhouse gas protocol or ISO 14064-1. Uh, and then there's reasonable. Those limited and reasonable, they mirror like a CPA if you're monitor, if you're um, getting third-party assurance for your financials. Limited and reasonable, which we'll talk about later, um, that's the difference. The highest rigor is a greenhouse gas verification to a standard at the reasonable level. And then what does that look like as far as, again, comparisons I love? It follows that ESG assurance cycle or even your financials assurance cycle, but we do ESG assurance, so I love to, to compare the two. You can take ESG training and there's similar modules for that. What is ESG and sustainability? How do you break it down? But then you execute. You're doing often what folks do is a materiality assessment where you're not calculating emissions. You're actually looking at what are your material topics and why. And some folks also use ESG software if you're going to report to like a GRI standard or a SASB standard, and then you've got your spot check, and that's considered ESG pre-assurance. You're just having someone come and look at your systems, your data collection. They're not verifying the accuracy of the final claim, but they are looking at your processes and making sure that, hey, you're, you're on track, you're off track, change this, change that. Um, and then there's also something called limited KPI assurance for ESG. There's also limited report assurance if you're actually trying to say, I'm a compliant, a GRI compliant report, which is the most rigorous thing you can do. And then if you do it to a reasonable level, that's a higher level of sampling. Um, so you can also just do selected KPIs in your ESG report or the full report. Whereas greenhouse gas, it's pretty straightforward. You have to do the entire verification to a standard. You're not, there is no broader report um, that you'll typically look at. But that, if you're familiar with that process, that's a similarity. They have very similar steps and options along the way. So hopefully that just gives you a sense of where greenhouse gas gap analysis lives. 
And as I mentioned, we have greenhouse gas or we have ESG and sustainability training. It mirrors our greenhouse gas training that just ended. So I apologize for the old dates. We do it every quarter, but we have a foundation course that's um, for everyone. And that's just a couple hours and it's on demand video, but we have one, an ESG strategy course, one day for leadership, ESG execution for those people implementing uh, projects day to day, and then ESG reporting for those in communications or investor relationships who have to actually put together those final public statements on your program. So here are the steps. If you really wanna know, it's a simplified version of a full verification. So it comes before doing a verification of your greenhouse gas emissions inventory or your carbon footprint, but it is a simplification. There, the steps are evidence gathering. We'll look at how you gather your documentation and your data. We'll look at planning and we will actually go through the planning process to set up a schedule and an audit. We'll perform a gap audit on site. We'll look at your documents. We'll look at your facility and then you will get a findings log that we do not follow up on. That's one of the main differences too that we'll see in a second, but the findings log is for you. It's your report at the end to say, okay, we've got a great list of things. We understand that these are the things that we really need to improve um, to be in line with this future standard that we're trying to get. Um, but it's a fairly simple, you know, four steps and it's not that intense and rigorous, but it is incredibly helpful. Whereas if you look at the process steps for limited and uh, reasonable verification, you have finalized data. You cannot perform a verification without your final greenhouse gas emissions data that you want to claim in some sort of report that's public facing or to a regulatory agency or, or even internally, you have to have finalized data to do a verification. There's still the planning phase, but then there is a full audit and it has, it's not 10% sample. What 10% sampling means in this case is any emission sources by line item that are 10% of your total emission inventory or, or higher we will have to get, we'll have to sample that data all the way down to source evidence so that everything below that is considered insignificant enough with a limited um, classification that those smaller categories, which can be, there could be six or seven, there could be 13. It just allows you to not do every tiny little tedious thing. If it's not above 10%, we don't sample it. You still have a findings log, but you have to close out every finding in that log to be able to complete your verification. And then you get an opinion that usually comes in the form of an opinion statement and usually working through those findings and closings, you can get a, what's called a negative opinion, but that it's still a, a positive outcome. A negative opinion means that we have to say, because we only uh, sampled 10% and above, that we did not find any evidence that would suggest that the data is incorrect, which is a technicality, but it's important. Whereas if you come to the reasonable level of verification, still need finalized data, you still do the um, in-depth planning, conduct a full audit, but the threshold moves down to 5%. So per emission source, anything 5% or higher, um, we will sample down to source evidence. They will have a findings log in closing and the opinion statement will be positive. So that means it will be stated as we did find enough evidence to suggest that the information is correct. And that is a, that's just in the assurance world, how it goes. There's still positive opinions. Um, some folks ask, you know, will we, what if we get a bad opinion or we say, hey, you know, we don't think this is correct. We will typically work with the company. It's very rare that we don't go through the findings and close out everything. Um, and it, but it, I will say that's one of the reasons folks get a gap analysis is that you can prevent the risk of ever getting um, to this point and feeling like you're not going to actually get an opinion statement that you can publish. So. One quick test, has your organization completed a baseline greenhouse gas emissions inventory or carbon footprint? You can be yes, currently in progress, no, or I don't know. But really you can't do any of these services. You can take training, um, you can begin executing and getting a carbon footprint um, or greenhouse gas emissions inventory started. You can test some of your calculation tools. But until you've actually started building an inventory, you can't get a gap analysis, let alone a verification. So you have to be so far along in the process. Um, we do have folks coming in saying, you know, I don't know. That's actually a perfectly fine answer. You're not alone in this. Um, if you're familiar with your company's reporting, if there's an internal website, unless you put out an annual ESG and sustainability report, um, you probably wouldn't have seen it anyway. 
um, often their internal documents until the company is publishing an annual sustainability report of some kind, and then they end up being couched within that um, actual annual report with broader information of social and environmental data. So I'll give it five more seconds. We definitely, congrats to the folks who have started, have a baseline. Some people are in progress. My hat is off to you. It's, it's definitely a worthwhile exercise. Definitely got some no's here. Um, I would say I'm not gonna encourage you to do it. I'm gonna encourage that you look at the drivers for your business. And if you have drivers that you haven't considered before, then consider doing it and take it seriously if you think that it's gonna impact your company. Um, and the I don't knows, I would just Google on your website. <laughs> put climate footprint or greenhouse gas emissions inventory or carbon footprint in the name of your company, and you should be able to find that. Okay. Um, next, let's talk about two examples so you can see that what they look like in, in reality. Um, we have, oh, and sorry, I just, I saw some of the questions. It wasn't a question, but to the Jeffrey who sent this in, not really ESG related, but helps establish our social license to operate. That's a fantastic reason. I know that that's back to, I missed it, but it's back to the reasons or the drivers for doing a greenhouse gas inventory in the first place. Um, and I do think that if you look at just the public um, atmosphere, that folks are really asking for it in a lot of ways. The two business examples, one I'll just show you, here's a snapshot of some of my team, they're fantastic. I would say it's hard pressed to find someone, you know, Ursula has 18 plus years with SGS. Riem has done consulting before that, is also now a lead auditor. Um, she's in Canada. Arsh is a lead assurer who does ESG and sustainability work. And I've been 15 plus years in consulting on not only greenhouse gas, but everything else. Um, and so we have 20 plus years of greenhouse gas gap analysis experience between us. Um, but far broader than that with verification, CDP, science-based targets, training, calculations. So we've got, we've got a great group of people here to help. And what that looks like is here's, a, here's two different things. This one was conducted and there was no verification that same year. So they wanted it as a gap analysis. They did not have any mandatory or pressing needs to say we have to do a full verification. And so they went with six full contract days. We did uh, the, the logistics company. We went on site. We had some of it virtual, but we did have to go on site and they got a findings log um, as an example that you can see there that was prioritized on the list of uh, risks that they needed to address. And then they got a detailed summary report of that findings log and there was no follow-up. We did not try to close any of those findings with them. And the, after the delivery of the summary report, we have to, um, pretty much just kind of wash our hands of it because we have to verify as an independent third party. So we don't do a lot of hand-holding and consulting um, ever if we're going to also provide a future verification. So you can see that it's fairly contained. It's pretty easy to understand. You know exactly what you're getting. And then this client, this logistics company went away and took what we did for them and they took the next steps. Um, they actually came back the next year and we did a verification just so you can see how it fit into their stair-step approach. And then here's an electronics manufacturing example. And this was different. They used the gap analysis, but they did it as a pre-audit with their verification later in the same year, which is also very common. Those are the two most common ways to approach it. For this reason, they did three days of a gap analysis. There was also the very, there was an in-person, there was some virtual. We did a findings log, um, but we did that later. We came back. And we went through all the findings as a part of the actual verification. And we followed up with that in detail. We still had to close all of those findings. Many of them were already closed by the time we started the formal verification process. But there was an additional five verification days at the end with another in-person and virtual meetings. And we actually got to see their finalized data, had to validate the claims and the final numbers that were in their scope one, two, and three emissions. So that was combined all into one year. And it does have to be done very segmented um, because the verification on its own has to live as um, as the ability to meet the standard ISO 14064-1, whereas the, the gap analysis um, was just those initial reviews of planning, documentation, data collection, systems, things like that. Sometimes people want us to look at their statement of, or their standard operating procedures, whatever their program is, we review that. And so that's the second most common example that you will see. 
So then knowing that, what are the timing and benefits? I showed that there were two examples. Really, it's either on its own and you maybe never get a full verification. You might never decide to. Some companies just do it the next year or in the future, but some people do use it as a piece of the larger verification um, to build that confidence leading into it to, um, I'd say the, the best example is if they have a tight deadline on publishing a report and they're worried that their final data, the time between their final data being available, so that gives them a tight window to complete the verification that they still want it published within a few weeks or a month. And therefore they want to make sure they don't get into any huge findings log that they just can't work through in that short amount of time. So the ideal schedule is it is a perfect lead into formal verification. So if you're going to do that, you should give yourself three to six months if you're going to do it as a lead in for sure, because that means that you're going to have time to deal with those findings. You're going to have your team talk to our team, review your report, but you're going to be able to go back and make some changes, especially if you find that something wasn't even aligned with the standard. Um, you want to give yourself that extra time before actually conducting the formal verification. And so three to six months is that sweet spot that we highly recommend. And then the benefits of that are threefold. So you're typically looking at doing a gap analysis because there's cost savings, time savings, and data confidence. Mm -hmm. For cost savings, one is just less rigor than a verification. So if it's not required to do a verification, you absolutely will save money. Um, and you can still feel confident that you got a review of some kind, but it's not going to be verified to any standard. If you're using the same vendor, which I highly re recommend you do, you reduce the cost of the verification. So you're, you're putting them together, even though you're breaking it apart and having you know, three to six months, you do the gap analysis. Because the same vendor has conducted the gap analysis, they're able to lean on their own experience and effectively use that to say, we don't have to verify some of these systems and documentation collective collection, we've already done it. But if you use a difference, so for instance, we have been asked SGS to come in um, and somebody had already done some gap analyses and I would see it going both ways for anybody in our in industry because we all, we all understand the rules and the reason for our existence, but we would never take like a certificate of some other company and just take the next step because we don't know the validity of their process and we don't, we don't know the qualifications of their staff. And so we can't just say, oh, our competitor did this and now you've come to us. We'll just skip ahead and we'll, we'll believe everything that they said and we'll put our name and our stamp on this verification. That's just not what anybody in our industry should be doing. Um, and so that's why I say if you use the same vendor, it does reduce the cost of your actual verification because it still plays into it very well. Time savings, there's just fewer steps in the verification. As we mentioned, if a verification is not required, you're still getting a good look at your system. Um, even if you don't have final data yet, you're able to look at the process. And then again, if you're using the same vendor, it reduces the work of the verification because you're not doubling up on those steps. So it does provide time savings. And then data confidence in two, two ways, I would say your internal team, this is probably the most overlooked and most important is your internal team, if you start doing greenhouse gas for the first time, you're probably going to sit there a few times looking at your spreadsheet or looking at your invoices and say, I don't know if we're doing this right. And there's no worse feeling than trying to collect data and you're going to make business decisions based off that data when you alone don't even feel confident that you're doing it correctly. So if nothing else, getting internal team confidence that you feel like, hey, we're, we believe this, we understand the calculations, and we're gonna be able to make decisions and identify opportunities for reductions or cost savings based on this data. The other data confidence is for external stakeholders, whether it's investors or customers or whoever else um, is interested in asking for this information, they typically want a limited or reasonable assurance. So you do need to understand that a gap analysis, one of the drawbacks is it will not get you a, a signed and stamped opinion statement because those are only available in our industry from a full verification, which mirrors the assurance world, um, whether it's limited or reasonable. And they typically, it, it steps up the confidence. They want limited as a first step. And then later, often they'll ask for, hey, you've been doing this for a while. Why don't you get reasonable assurance to make sure that we are, you know, we believe you even more. Um, 
So one question is re-measuring emissions. I don't think, so re-measuring emissions, you don't ever re-measure um, except for year after year if you're gonna do a follow-up um, annual emissions. So if you're asking about when you come back, I think the only time you need to re-measure is if on the same year is if you find that there's findings or a request for new information or a request for a, um, a change in your system or in the way you're declaring something. Those are the things that you may have to recalculate. I wouldn't say re-measure. Typically, it's just that the calculation or the emission factor was wrong or we found a, a fat-fingered mistake in a spreadsheet that there just wasn't it wasn't being done correctly, but typically the system that you use will recalculate, recalculate that automatically. What you will have to do is use the same approach and boundaries that you drew the first year for your baseline and make sure you're consistent measuring in future years. Otherwise, you're not allowed to compare year over year um, because you changed the methodology. And that is, man, that's the fastest I've ever gone through there. And so what questions do you have? We covered a lot of ground. Hopefully it's clear. I do think if you've never done the verification all the way through, then it still might be a little confusing, but type any of your questions into the chat box and we will ask them as far as um, anything that wasn't clear. Does GHG regulation require when the baseline GHG emissions carry out and then after when to be repeated? Yes. Um, so the regulations, and I'll go back, it really depends on which regulation you're talking about. But the majority of regulations that I mentioned here at the very beginning of the, of the presentation, like the Canadian federal supplier rule, the US federal supplier rule, the SEC climate ruling, um, and the greenhouse gas reporting program, they all, they all essentially follow greenhouse gas protocol, which is also the basis for ISO 14064-1 also dash two and 14067, but those are project and product footprints where 14064-1 is organizational footprint. Those are the most common ones we deal with unless you're trying to sell carbon offsets. And then we also verify those, but those are typically on a registry. But yes, all of them, once you get into a habit of reporting, I, ha I will say very rarely I've seen a two year window where people will Organizations will recalculate every two years. For whatever reason, what I will tell you is that, you know, if you're if you're doing that, you should still be collecting all your data monthly. Even if you're calculating every year, that's a lot of time. You really should be looking at this monthly. If you want it to be actionable and you want to actually be able to make a difference, adjust, see reductions, um, achieve any targets or goals any data on a yearly timeline is useless because you cannot react fast enough. So even if you're doing it yearly, you really should be looking at it monthly. And if you're looking at it monthly, anyone who's asking for this information, maybe you don't wanna report externally to anybody because of competitive you know, secrecy, whatever you think, but any external stakeholder, they're gonna to wanna to see an update probably more than a year, but definitely at, at a year um, cadence. And so, why you wouldn't put it every year is sort of a mystery to me unless you're in one of those unique situations where absolutely no one externally is asking for it um, and you just you just want that information internally that's something i don't come across very often um, if you there is a there is a there is a recalculation of your baseline so if you actually have a merger or an acquisition um, if you divest a big portion of your company or several large facilities, there is a threshold at which you do need to actually recalculate your baseline because you're no longer comparing apples to apples. So I'll throw that in there too. Thank you, Haroon. That's a great question. Uh, Monica says, what is the best way to establish a baseline? We are a small company. Our customers are starting to ask about our carbon footprint. Um, Monica, great question. The only way to establish a baseline is either to yourselves build a nice spreadsheet, especially as a small company, you'll probably get by with a spreadsheet or, you know, hire somebody like SGS or someone else who can help you do the calculations or help you build the spreadsheet. But when you look at stair stepping in, we tell people why we tell people to look at the drivers is there's often dipping your toe in the water and then getting more advanced as you go. 
I always recommend training so you know what you're getting yourselves into. And if you can do it on your own, you're going to save a ton of money. Um, even if you don't do it on your own and you want to hire someone, you can kind of scale down the consulting or the advisory services that you get. But you need to build a spreadsheet that identifies usually your scope one and two emissions, which are basically anything on site that you own. Um, I would tell people if you can put like food coloring or something in an emission and it comes out purple or green, if you physically see that emitting from your property, anything that you own, including vehicles that you drive around, that is typically scope one and scope two. Scope one is things like natural gas, refrigerants, uh, fuel in vehicles or fuel in heating and cooling systems or some other thing. Uh, there's a stationary and mobile forms of fuel. And then scope two is just because you buy it um, and technically it happens off site, but purchased electricity from the utility and or purchased steam sometimes. Uh, but usually scope two is almost always just purchased electricity. Those are things that you have. They're business as usual data. You can probably find the invoices, but you have to track it consistently in a spreadsheet that doesn't miss any months. And it has a very clear boundary over what you're counting and what you're not counting. And then what you do is take the business data and you have to have something called an emission factor from the EPA or other sources that you research and you multiply say gallons of fuel times a researched amount of, hey, there's this many carbon emissions from this type of fuel. So there's a couple steps and it's basically just collecting your business data, having an emission factor bank, and then there's something called global warming potential of whatever the gas is that releases from it because everything gets converted into carbon dioxide. So even though they call it a carbon footprint, a lot of it's gonna be um, methane, a lot of it's gonna be N2O, and they'll basically just convert it all into the same intensity of carbon so that it's all one number, um, so it's less confusing. So at the end, you just have one single number for your carbon footprint, but it's possibly, it's, it's easily the mix of three different gases, but it could be five or six gases depending on the complexity of your operation. Um, but you can simplify it down. It is a pretty straightforward set of math um, that you get performed in a spreadsheet. So uh, that's how you establish your baseline. And then you measure the same year after year. You check that your emission factors are still consistent. You check that your global warming potential is still consistent. You check that you didn't greatly change the, the boundaries of which you're actually measuring. Um, and then you collect the same data in the same way year over year. Your first baseline is always the hardest and the most time consuming, but typically you just rinse and repeat year after year, and then you review to make sure there were no changes in your operations that really throw things off. Um, but that's the, the long answer to how do you establish a baseline. And more questions. When calculating, so thank you, Monica. Andrew says, when calculating scope two greenhouse gas emissions for purchased electricity, how does different types of generated purchased electricity come into play when doing the calculation? <coughs> Pardon me, let me get something to drink. It's a great question. They each have their own line item, Andrew, as coal will have a different emission factor than nuclear, and they actually have different emission factors. There's something called market-based, which is um, a very kind of like an averaged amount over a region that they do track, like the EPA keeps track of this, and there's location-based, where if you have a specific utility, they will actually provide you and say, hey, all of, you know, all of your electricity comes from us, we have an emission factor, a, lo a location-based emission factor, and that's the most accurate version. And typically you wanna do both um, and see how they compare, but that's that's how you treat different uh, um, types of purchase electricity is you break them out by type. And if you get it all from the same utility, that's taken care of within their location-based emission factor. It actually, you don't have to know that breakdown separately. Um, the utility company does that work for you and gives you a location-based emission factor for all of your kilowatt hours as if they were equal. And a market-based is similar, but they're averaging multiple utilities over a region. Um, hope that was helpful. Uh, Luis says, can you go further deep on the ESG ratings as drivers for continuous improvement? I can, Luis. Um, we have an entire one-day course on this, but I can jump back to... I can just tell you um, 
I'm not sure what how deep we want to go. The drivers for continuous improvement, here's what I'll share. The people like to complain about all of these because they're privately held companies. They all started to serve a particular investor group, and then they grew and expanded over time because that's what for-profit companies do. They said, hey, we're, we're making money serving this group of investors. Let's serve a larger group of investors. And for that reason, they are all different. They don't use the same methodology. They don't use the same type of scorecard. Um, however, on the flip side, what people appreciate about them is these are the ones that have stood the test of time. Many, many, many have gone by the wayside um, in the past 20 years. They do have some consistency. What you will see today, and there's probably going to be more consistency over time, it actually wouldn't shock me if they, they combine or align and stop being five if one day it becomes three or something like that. But they all have a composite score that is one single score. It is made up of smaller subscores, which is usually environmental, social, and governance. There are some that have, like Ecovadis has a fourth score, which is your supply chain score. They call it sustainable procurement. Um, and then they all show you a, an industry chart. They put you in a very specific industry and say, hey, we're, we're not just giving everybody the same methodology. This is a, say, automotive. And so you're being ranked with a methodology that prioritizes ESG disclosures that are mostly relevant and material to automotive companies. And therefore, they put you in a peer chart and says, of all the automotive companies in this group, you're you're here. You're either a, a leader, a laggard, you're, you're average, you're below average. But you can see those three things within all of these. And most of them give you a fairly detailed you know, PDF report that helps you take the next steps. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, they're also all charging you for consulting services, which is, again, some people love it, some people hate it, some people... Like me, I just see that there's always a plus and a minus. They, they're all very similar, but they don't look the same. You, when you don't get the same output, and you won't get the same score from ISS that you will from MSCI and vice versa. And so it's not like it's all straightforward, but they do have a consistent output, which is final score made up of subscores that they show you, peer comparison within your industry, and a report that tells you why you got the score you got. So I hope that helps. Those reports that they have for continu continuous improvement are good. I, like I said, we have an ESG rating boost where, where I think we get better and more detailed. But if you're familiar with those and the process of continuous improvement, you can identify your highest risk areas and start to build a program to improve your score. So that's what I would say. And we can always help. Meboob, you said, if a company does not own cars, but employees commute to work with their own cars, do you include this in the calculation? Fantastic question. It depends. If you say employee commute, that is always a, because it's not an owned asset by the company, it's automatically what's called a scope three or supply chain emissions. Um, ISO actually, for whatever reason, they call it something different. They say categories three through six. So category one and category two are the same for ISO and greenhouse gas protocol, but then it greenhouse gas protocol ha, calls it scope three, and then they list 15 categories, which one of them is employee commuting. So if you're not doing scope three emissions, you don't have to include it. Um, and if you're doing scope three emissions, it's usually just one of the easier ones to survey your employees, but it might not be the highest impact. Usually for ISO, they make you do a risk assessment or a significance um, evaluation. And you can say, hey, we, we did a rough calculation, an estimate. We don't think it's very significant. It's less than 1%. So we're not going to disclose employee commute. Or employee commute might be your fourth highest one. It just depends on your operation. But it's, it's definitely in the scope three supply chain side. And it is not mandatory. Um, and a lot of these regulatory schemes are first asking companies just to start with scope one and two, and then later evolve into scope three. So great question. Robert says, are you familiar with CARB LCFS credits? If you sell these, will this negatively impact your emission factor? California Air Resource Board. Familiar, yes, Robert, but not, um, not as intimately as I could. I can tell you that if Ursula was on here, she's, she's not only one of our lead verifiers, but she's the one who has 18 years of experience. 
if it's a credit, if you can you tell me what the and I could even pull it up on the side and just see LCFS credit. If it's anything like a carbon credit, um, the only way to get the, yeah, it says it's a credit, so for carbon. If you sell these, it doesn't, it depends on who you are. So if you're buying credits, those count um, as offsets, but they do not actually erase your footprint. And so what you would find in an opinion statement, so this might be a really good example, and companies can still use this, they do use credits to varying degrees, and you can even become a certified carbon neutral organization. Um, credits are allowed in different schemes in different ways. Um, but if you're if you're an organization, say, that is not producing renewable energy, but you're buying that credit through the CARB program to offset your existing emissions. Say you're not, I'll keep going with this automotive, um, you, you manufacture automotive parts. You're buying those credits to offset your emissions at your facility. They, they do not erase them. They still show up in your emissions inventory in the final count, but next to that, we'll say there is another line that says number of off or the amount of offsets and what percentage of that did you offset 100%? And it would have to say where they're from. Are they from CARB LCF credits, LCFS credits? Some people say, hey, we only want gold standard or only want BCS Vera. And they will have the things that they're looking for. But you have to disclose those side by side. They do not eliminate them. They, they literally offset it. And they're just shown side by side um, as two different line items. And you can use that to claim carbon neutrality. So I hope that helps. Um, Anil says, will publicly traded companies ESG rating be impacted if it decides to obtain reasonable assurance instead of verification? Oh, so here I think, Anil, that you're going after, um, the, the, there's a clear difference between, because the, there is reasonable verification or greenhouse gas verification to a reasonable level of assurance. Those are from what's called more of an operational standard from the ISO standpoint, ISO 14064-1. You can, just for, the, for everyone listening, I'm sure, Anil, you understand this. You can, and we do as a service, use more of a CPA approach where, especially if you're doing a full report, we might do greenhouse gas emissions assurance because we're also doing 12 other KPIs with some water, some waste, some turnover, some DEI initiative metrics. And if a company wants to do it all in one, um, they can just choose to use a different assurance standard where in the past that's been ISAE 3000 and ISAE combined with 3410. And that is more of a CPA assurance uh, for financial statements. It does, it's accepted. It is a lower level of rigor than an operational standard like ISO, where it doesn't require on-site visits. And so that's the only reason why some folks, depending on who your stakeholders are and some investors, they do frown upon it and they often will say, and we do, we do this as a service, we'll combine the two. We'll say, hey, we're doing an assurance of your report and the component only on the greenhouse gas emissions, we will actually conduct that to the rigor of an ISO 14064-1 they'll be combined. You'll get two separate certificates. One will be for all of them and one will just be for the greenhouse gas, but they will, they will both, ha both have the greenhouse gas listed in them. Sorry, that's a super complex kind of question, but hopefully you understand like an, on an output, it's not that your ESG rating will be impacted unless that scoring agency does not value and weight assurance the same way it does ISO standards. We cannot tell you that because that's the that's the private um, undisclosed part, part. The methodology and the, the algorithms of those ESG rating agencies are sort of their competitive advantage. It's also why people complain about them and why they're sometimes the subject of lawsuits. Um, but that is the difference. I can't tell you, usually they're seen pretty similarly. We haven't seen a huge difference, but that rating is impossible for us to tell because it gets adjusted sometimes annually, but they're, they live in the same world. They're quite similar, but ISO verification, for instance, specific to greenhouse gas is more rigorous because they require on-site 
and a deeper level of investigation than more of a CPA approach where it's a lot of desk research and show us the documentation. Um, Arun, great question though, and you know, um, hopefully I got to the point of what you're actually asking. And Haroon says, for a globally operating company, the carbon footprint will be calculated over countries individually or as overall for the whole business, including all operating countries. Another great question. It is up to you, um, but it really depends on what your stakeholders are requiring. You can stair step it in just like a lot of other places where you may start with you know, one region um, like the United States or North America, where you feel like you have the best data and then you'll disclose, you'll have to disclose that. And that's called a boundary disclosure. When you define the boundaries of your report, you will say the, the facilities in scope include these. And what was out of scope, it was everything in East Asia and you can justify it and say, you know, we just didn't have the same level of data collection or, but typically regardless of the, the timing, Ultimately, most stakeholders, most investors, most regulatory bodies, they want you to ultimately have a company-wide footprint. And anytime it's not, you have to justify it within the, within the boundary discussion and have a plan for overcoming whatever you um, left out, whatever was not in scope or whatever you excluded. You either have to justify it, hey, we're never gonna include this for these reasons, or we excluded it this year only because of X and our plan to include it in the future is Y. And so that's that's really, it does come down to the pressure at which you're being asked to get to the finish line. Um, but that's one of those ways that you can stair step in is to do it regionally until you've actually covered your entire operations. But ultimately, they're always wanting a global footprint. Um, any, so thank you, everyone. These are great questions. Hopefully I'm getting to the root of what you're actually asking. Um, here's a question. Do you recommend waiting until the new SEC or federal supplier rules are adopted before taking action? I, I've told you my personal opinion on what I think it's gonna be is scope one and scope two. I don't think a legal challenge will hold up. Um, you can disagree with me, that's totally fine, but you will find out in October what whether they did water it down and make it just scope one and scope two, so you can wait till then. But ultimately I would say if you look at the trend globally, what is happening is more regulation. The only universally sort of adopted regulation that is consistent across all regions is climate disclosures for greenhouse gas. There is There are the most tools, there is the most agreement on calculation methodologies. I don't think greenhouse gas disclosure is going away, even if it gets delayed you can look at other regions. I think it's here to stay and it's only gonna get bigger. So I wouldn't wait, but I would, if you're feeling hesitant, you can always start with training. And if you wanna start with something, dip your toe in, just do a, a scope one, a scope two. Um, you don't even, you can just do that. I would recommend if you're not gonna get it verified, at least consider a gap analysis um, because you wanna be confident in that information. But at that point, maybe you wanna pause, come up for air, and look around and reassess the market and see if there's any other pressure. Um, but that's what I would I would never say just wait because when regulation happens, you're already behind. And so if you're not trying to prepare for some of it that is likely, I just think you'll put yourself in a precarious situation. If you haven't received any requests from big customers in your supply chain like CDP or Ecovatus, do you need to worry about it? Not directly, but I would say Again, research. Um, I mentioned a couple of things. Go just Google CDP supply chain members and look for companies in your industry because that is growing quickly. And even if your customers aren't on that list, they might be soon, especially if all their competitors are on that list. And so they're not want to, they don't want to get left out. They also want to participate because if you participate, you get access to all this aggregate data. Um, it's incredibly valuable for making decisions. And same thing with Ecobonus, you can go look at Google Ecovatus industry initiatives and look for your industry because there are more and more brands hopping on and saying, we're gonna require our suppliers to report to Ecovatus. And so by far CDP and Ecovatus are the largest platforms growing quickly. Ecovatus the biggest, CDP the second. Um, it's 159, so I think I'll just stop. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you Haroon. Um, 
And just thanks to everybody for coming. This is the tons of questions, which I love. So thank you for coming. If you have anything else, reach out to us um, in okay. the future. Um, I'm going to jump in here and just to remind the audience to fill out the feedback form that's going to come. And we'd like to thank Adam Amos for a wonderful presentation and our sponsor, SGS North America. And on behalf of VHS Today, have a safe and productive remainder of your day. Thank you, everybody.